<laughs> it was sworn out of a stack of Bibles that, you know, Swift is volatile. We will never, oh, no, no, we would never <laughs> use it for political purposes. Uh, well, that, that went away when they wanted to go after Iran. And then eventually, you know, basically everybody they want to go after, Swift is good uh, thing. You know, Russia knows this, uh, um, Venezuela, you name it. So uh, once you start weaponizing the banking system, don't be surprised if people start going elsewhere. And the logical thing is not to replace the U.S. with one country the way, you know, the U.S. sees it, king of the hill. <laughs> uh, they really see it as an opportunity to create something new. And, and this, that's what we're talking about. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I have the great pleasure of talking to two colleagues from our Multipolar Peace Alliance again. And I've got with me uh, Einar Tangen, who's a senior fellow at the Taihe Institute. And the other one is John Pang, a senior research fellow at the Perak Academy, a think tank in Malaysia. Hello, both of you. Oh, it's Hello. a pleasure to be here, Pascal. Great to be uh, here. Well, fantastic that you made the time because we want to talk a little bit about BRICS and the Pacific and what to expect for the upcoming meeting in Kazan because the rumor has it that, well, Malaysia sent in an application, we know that much, but will, will um, the uh, Malaysian prime minister be there? Um, what can come out of this? Will this be the first step of ASEAN into, into BRICS? Um, both of you, what is your reading from the current from the current developments? Maybe uh, Einar first, and then John. Well, you're you're picking picking the amateur over the expert. <laughs> no. Anyways, um, yeah, no, I mean, obviously, uh, well, first off, congratulations to Malaysia. They were picked in the top ten of the uh, best uh, most peaceful countries uh, just recently in a poll. Um, but you, yes. Indonesia, Malaysia are kind of on the periphery. Both of them have been looking at this. I think there are repercussions uh, gradually for uh, things like ASEAN. You know, you start looking at how many regional players there are and whether or not those regional players start to coalesce and you start to have a movement of regional groups as well as individual countries towards BRICS. Uh, it starts as a trickle, but I think it, in the end, it will be a rush. Um, and the reason is that right now there's just too many meetings. I mean, you know, you have an ASEAN, you, you have uh, you know, uh, 20, 30 different meetings. Um, you know, the leaders can only go to so many. It's, it's time to start con uh, consolidating. And I don't mean this in terms of uh, power, but I mean it just literally in terms of uh, time uh, efficiency. You, uh, you can't afford to spend the time to talk about the same exact issues at so many different uh, venues. Um, you know, the, the physical travel is, is exhausting. And as I said, it's a duplicative. So hopefully BRICS becomes that kind of center point. Uh, and it voids this idea that somehow it's controlled by China. You have very powerful players in there. Um, it hopefully it becomes more than just Global South, also includes the uh, stands mm -hmm. um, and you know, really starts to pick up momentum where the UN has kind of left off, uh, still squabbling over the Security Council, who should be on it, but not really dealing with the issue that uh, you have five players who have a veto. The, the the UN is the one organization, but ASEAN for Southeast Asia is the other. I mean, John, I'm not interpreting uh, this move of Malaysia towards BRICS as a move away from ASEAN, um, more complementary to ASEAN, but how do you see it? Uh, it's certainly not a move away from, from ASEAN. Uh, Malaysia would be there fully as a an ASEAN member um, if, if, if admitted or when they're admitted. Um, I think the um, Malaysian Prime Minister, uh, Anwar Ibrahim, was, um, I hear, invited to it. So uh, he may be there. Um, we, um, I haven't heard much more about you know, Malaysia's status. As, as you know, I think uh, BRICS uh, has um, signaled uh, the intention to consolidate for a little while. They have such a long list of uh, applicants, and I think it's, it's right that they sit down and ask themselves uh, what they want in terms of of membership and what they want to do with the organization, um, whether they're going to organize a secretariat, for example. So it's really a an infant organization that has you know grown um, 
very, very popular and they need to figure these things out. And I, sh- I'm, I suppose uh, Kazan will be one place where they do that. Malaysia's, um, you know, th- the way Malaysia or or any other ASEAN, major ASEAN country, you know, Indonesia or Singapore, if they were to attend, they would also do so. If no other ASEAN countries are there, they would also be there as in, you know, in their stead as, as representing ASEAN. So it would be very interesting to see the first ASEAN country um, take part in BRICS. As you mentioned earlier, it it, it takes away uh, even more from the narrative that BRICS is somehow controlled by, you know, uh, by China. You know, ASEAN is uh, presumably a smaller organization, although in, in you know, not that small in terms of numbers. It's 10 going on 11 now uh, countries. That's certainly not, nobody would describe ASEAN as dominated by China. Uh, so, yeah, it's so it really takes away from that from that narrative um, even more. Now, having said that, I think ASEAN has a a history, a background um, that that BRICS doesn't have. So, you know, it's for BRICS to build these things up, but but ASEAN has a whole kind of regional multilateral structure around it that's quite well developed. Yes, I think uh, Aina makes a great point. There needs to be some consolidation, some thinking about the calendar, so so people are not not duplicating. But the very fact that that people are talking about the same thing in different fora is is, is good. Yeah, I see the I see BRICS as a kind of reaction. It's it's not just a project by itself to the failures of the so called rules based international order. Um, yeah. And I remember a previous discussion that we had in which we kind of came to the conclusion that. Um, BRICS and the multipolar world, the way that they, that we're seeing it emerge around us, it is will run or is now going to run much closer on the ideas, the way that ASEAN was working on the ASEAN way and consensus. And we know from the, all the BRICS documents that BRICS also works on consensus. Um, yes, Einar, um What's this going to do to the organization? Because consensus is easy for a couple of countries to, to get. I mean, even there, it can be, it can be difficult. But the bigger this organization gets, is, doesn't it run the, 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 the danger that it will overload itself and become like it, it won't be able to move anymore? Well, no, and then that's the, uh, the real uh, issue here. And one uh, which people suspect the U.S. is going to try to... Um... Uh, exacerbate because uh, well, they see this as a, as a real threat. I mean, all of these countries coming together in an alternate organization that they're not interested in, that they've actually kind of poo pooed behind the <laughs> closed doors. Um, <clears throat> they said, "Oh, it's you know they'll never do anything." Uh, but with you know things like the uh, currency um, issue, really, that is sending shivers up and down the the spine of the Fed uh, as well as the U.S. Treasury. Um, and you, you see this, this movement, as you pointed out, you can either, in, the, in a kind of multipolar situation, uh, situation, you have chaos, no one can agree, all right, or you can have consensus and cooperation. They all begin with C. Uh, the latter two are probably the preferable ones. And I, th- I think when, when you start looking at the model that uh, China has been pushing, uh, this idea that, you know, countries, what do they want? At, at the very base. They want to be secure. They don't want to be attacked and they don't want to attack anybody else. All right. Second, they they need to have a path to development. And this is especially true for all the nations that were traumatized by colonialism. They're still feeling the after effects. You see the Sahils, five countries in Africa who, you know, basically broke away from France. Why? Because they said, well, we sell, you know, our our impoverished workers who you regularly film and, you know, claim, you know, this is terrible human rights abuse. Well, they sell yellow cake to France for 80 uh, cents euro. And, you know, France turns around, sells the same yellow cake for 200 euros per pound. Uh, And they say, well, this is unfair. We need to take uh, control. Uh, one of uh, the issues is how do you make this um, <clears throat> in the interest of these groups? I mean, it's fine to say consensus and kind of cooperation, and everything like that, but consensus about what? I mean, right now, these are the countries that are suffering the most uh, from the economic uh, fallout from the U.S., all right? The dollar-denominated loans are crushing them every time the dollar goes higher, all right. They have uh, situations uh, with their um, you know, resources uh, going out to markets. Uh, when the resource markets are down, they're suffering. 
So there has to be a sea change in how you uh, get these people to uh, to agree. And one of those, I think, is really uh, this idea about getting nations together who control strategic resources. And what I say, look at OPEC. OPEC has been able since 73 to have a say in what the price of oil is because they completely you know, they have the, the supply. Well, you know, take this to coffee. There are three nations who, you know, basically control the coffee market. We're talking about almost 70, 80 percent. Why don't those three nations, say, instead of saying, well, you know, we just sell it off to somebody else who's going to make actually more money. I mean, Starbucks sells for five bucks a, a cup, uh, something that uh, they're buying for uh, basically, you know, uh, 20, 30 cents. So if these nations come together and they say, look, we're going to price our resources at a level where we can have development, where we can take care of climate change issues, it would be a game changer. Yes, prices would go up around the world, but it would be a rebalancing of the kind of, uh, you know, the way that things happened over the last 350 years with colonialism doing the exact opposite. They just took all the money and ran back to the U.S. and, uh, and Europe now this would rebalance it. And co countries would have to be very competitive to compete in this environment. But that's some, an example of what I think is necessary to coalesce these people. You're not gonna cooperate if there's nothing to cooperate about. You have to have a new idea. Now, do you think, John, that that might be one of the roles of BRICS to, to create these ideas and create the spaces where these kind of, of, of groupings can come together? Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I now put it very well. Um, because it is it is still in its uh, sort of nascent stage, they have to decide on what they come together around. Um, and uh, scale is actually one of the early, you know, uh, or economic significance is one of the early criteria. You know, the whole thing began as bricks for a particular reason, these, these largest emerging economies. So it's not, you know, an alternate UN you know, in the sense of of being all inclusive of the entire global South, there has to be a strategic um, intent there and path, and 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 certainly this rebalancing of um, kind of global political economy is is a really important objective, and I think what everybody's looking to is the role of finance um, in that, and the role of the dollar. So that's the big announcement, a big set of initiatives being. Um, scrutinized right now, or people waiting for, yeah. And so it's it's really the the context of the dollar as an as an issue, dependence on the dollar as an issue, and um, how you um, you come out of that, how you solve that problem collectively. Yeah, and the, the, mm -hmm. we've seen a couple of these attempts, right, at ameliorating mm -hmm. a the situation for an entire grouping by attack by tackling the finance sector, the, the biggest example, and I think failed example, is the euro for the European Union, or like the eurozone, which which it is now, and, and this one has huge, huge problems. So I do not expect that BRICS or anyone would want to imitate that approach. Yeah, um, exactly. But that raises the question, what would be the approach in order to, to simultaneously maintain national currencies um, get a, go away from the dollar, but increase trading and uh, opportunities, right? In order to make cross-border payments possible without uh, without without coalescing around a new uh, currency, which then will just create another dollar, but for somebody else. I don't. I can't imagine that any one of the the, the BRIC states would want that to see for the yeah. other one. So um, maybe Einar, what do you with what? Well, do you no, think I, I completely agree with you. I mean, uh, for instance, China would be the the natural one to do that. They have 140 primary trade relations uh, with 140 countries. There's there's only 193 countries in total, so it gives you an idea. But they don't want it. They've seen what the what this has done to the U.S. economy, the warping effects, uh, the you know tendency to borrow money but have no plan to pay it back. These are real issues. So I think what you, you see. Uh, kind of coalescing is this idea that there would be a independent currency backed uh, probably by a basket of currencies uh, from within uh, the, uh, the BRICS uh, basket. And uh, it wouldn't include all nations. Obviously, there's too much volatility in that. But then you have this kind of third measure. You have to have a one measure 
uh, in order to exchange. Uh, but the ability to hold this, uh, this currency, um, a separate currency, would take away the biggest problem that people have right now, which is the, the weaponization of SWIFT. No, no one was talking about this you know, 15, 20 years ago, before the U.S. decided that they, uh, you know, it's okay to use SWIFT, which it was, <laughs> it was sworn out of a stack of Bibles that, you know, SWIFT is volatile. We will never, oh, no, no, we would never <laughs> use it for political purposes. Uh, well, that, that went away when they wanted to go after Iran, and then eventually, you know, basically everybody they want to go after, SWIFT is a good uh, thing. You know, Russia knows this, uh, um, Venezuela, you name it. So uh, once you start weaponizing the banking system, don't be surprised if people start going elsewhere. And the logical thing is not to replace the U.S. with one country the way, you know, the U.S. sees it, king of the hill. <laughs> uh, they really see it as an opportunity to create something new. And, and this, that's what we're talking about. Uh, the outmoded, um, you know, things that you know, they did work for a while after World War II. Uh, there was this uh, era of optimism. Somehow they can do it. It was ruined by success of conflicts in uh, Korea and then Vietnam, etc. But uh, there was still this feeling that somehow it could all work. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't. Times change. Uh, the dynamics are that you know, the solution you create today only creates new problems for tomorrow. So there's a dynamism going on. And right now, uh, the shift is towards uh, the global South regaining uh, what they have lost over so many years. And they have to have a game, game plan, plan to do that. And I think the currency really isn't the big issue as long as you, um, you, know, you have a number of countries supervising it. Uh, whose interests are not going to be uh, fully aligned. And I, I think BRICS is very conducive to that because you have a large number of resource providers, as well as China, which is a huge manufacturing uh, entity. Uh, having them there means, means that you're not going to have one entity deciding how this goes and more likely to remain neutral for longer. John, do you, do you, do you agree? Yep. Like, is that what we, yep. what, we are, what we can expect? Yep, I, I agree. I, I don't think we should expect to see a, um, you know, uh, any particular country, uh, least of all China, stand up uh, and offer its currency um, to be this sort of global trading currency. Although the ro role of the um, of the yuan is is growing in in China's own trade, um, but um, I think what's more likely is the kind of solution that uh, Aina pointed out, or a kind of multi currency system, so collaboration between central banks. Uh, with swap arrangements and so on, um, uh, to 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 coordinate flows and and to deal with uh, clearing. So, um, actually, you should really talk to um, uh, Kathleen Tyson, one of the members of of our group, about this. And she's she's a real expert who has really thought about this and actually written a book about it. But um, I think I agree with her with her perspective that it's neither necessary nor even uh, desirable. To have it replaced with a you know a single currency right now. Uh, moreover, nobody wants to see the U.S. dollar just collapse. Okay, so at some point when the Americans are ready to talk about it, they're not now. But uh, the the type of um, a global, truly global solution, not just within the global South, but with the U.S. and with Europe, um, sh you know, should should happen. You know, right now, I think the Global South and the BRICS countries are ready to go ahead until these, these other guys adjust to this uh, new world. But, you know, for example, Philip, the economist Philip Pilkington just came up with this, you know, kind of a Bretton Woods too, basically Keynes's idea for this, um, which was only partially realized at, at, at Bretton Woods. It's ideas like this need to be brought up. So it's about BRICS, but you know, in the medium term, it's it's uh, even, it's it's about much more than that. It's about what you do with the U.S. dollar. Yeah, but yeah. also historically speaking, we have we haven't seen a moment when a global currency went away or collapsed overnight. I mean, all yeah. of the big yeah. ones. I mean, even the pound and the French franc and, and so on. You know, they had an afterlife yes. and they're not unimportant yes. one. Uh, the question that I wonder is like if if nobody steps up and says I want to be the next global currency, um, um, one of the issues to tackle is that we will have this problem of trying to compare what it what is something worth. And if we look at the classic definitions of what money is, it's a it's a unit of account, it's a store of value, and it's a medium of exchange. 
And you could, and we had that, the beginning of the euro, the euro was really just a unit of account. It didn't exist as physical money. It was just, you couldn't we imagine something like this for the BRIC states, like a, a basket, Yep. the way that the BIS has it, where, Yes. where all of the currencies are inside, inside one, one unit, and then you can price everything in that unit without actually selling it in the unit. Is that imaginable? Yeah, I think it I, is. I think I think Yeah. I think it is. Um, I would put some caveats on that. First off, um, the idea of money, the paper currency, is slowly going away. There are very strong arguments for uh, countries to go to an e currency. You tax at point of transaction. Uh, you know, all, all, you can create smart contracts that basically get rid of 99% of the kind of useless contract arguments and, and a lot of lawyers and things like that. I'm a lawyer, so I'm, <laughs> I'm fully aware of what it'll, how it'll decimate the industry. Also accountants, uh, a lot of advisors and things like this. So there's an efficiency factor, which I think drives this also. When you start looking at the current system, You know, if I'm if I'm doing business overseas, my goodness, <laughs> that's a real bar to small and medium sized businesses because, you know, they have to get a bank, they have to get a, a banking relationship, there has to be set up these escrow accounts, letters of credit. Uh, it's expensive. Um, if you have a better way of doing that, and it's linked to this, uh, obviously the savings will be the one that drive it. Now remember, everything that we've done that has been. Uh, other than pornography that's been online, is all about efficiency. Even pornography, you could argue, because it's a delivery channel, uh, delivery vehicle. But I mean, you know, you, you smile, but this is, this is the reality. Um, so, I mean, the ability to take the transaction costs down low, all right, is very important. Look at credit card companies in the United States. They're still charging 2 and 3%. All right, on, on, on normal transactions, and then they're hitting you for you know if you if you don't pay your bills on time. Um, compare that to uh, in China right now, where if you do, do AliPay or WeChat Pay, uh, there's it's so small it's negligible. All right, and you know people get a better value. What does that do? It all flows to the bottom line, and by that I mean it increases disposable income, which is now available. Uh, to, in essence, uh, drive the uh, consumption economy much more efficiently than if it's being wasted uh, uh, with middlemen who, who really aren't adding a lot of value. I mean, what were the credit card companies supposed to do in the beginning? <laughs> you know, it was uh, you know, just a way of uh, buying things on, over time. You start looking at uh, the fees they charge, 23 24%. I mean, in the old days, they would have said that was usury. They would have been outlawed, <laughs> right out of, of town on a post. tarred and feathered but today it's good business uh so you know thing, things will change uh generally in the uh area towards efficiency lower cost and uh that's what will drive it in terms of uh, the mechanics because we have blockchain um because we can have an integration of uh, countries that are in essence creating a pool of funds just basically drawing right so it's not physical money All right. What they're saying is that uh, the China, we're going to put up, um, you know, three trillion into the pool and then uh, Russia is going to put in some and things like that. And that pool is then available as a, the currency swap uh, mechanism. Uh, it can all be accounted for. It has a real time dashboard, um, which would also be available to uh, countries <laughs> with an e-currency. And that would make a tremendous amount of difference. Efficiencies on both sides. John, do you want to react? No, I, I, I like that uh, scenario very much. I just want to observe that um, if that were to happen, uh, given the geopolitical um, divisions now, yeah, it's more likely to happen. Uh, it, it needs to happen across a, a group of uh, like-minded countries with a uh, a shared project such as BRICS. Yeah. So That's, this would I like be that. an ideal Like-minded. thing for BRICS to work on. Yeah, That, like, that was a like nice minded. mixture, John, of, of um, American like-minded and Yes. shared future. <laughs> the in-between between Shared China experience and the U.S. of having been uh, colonized and being having their economies in some state of you know it's not just an it's not an emotional thing. Their economies in this uh, a certain state of dependency, right? Their loans denominated into doll in 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 dollars and their um and their and their policy dependent on that of the uh, of the Fed. So, so these are things that countries will want to be getting out of. 
when it, when it, yeah. when it, Pascal, I want to add something else on that. And then, you know, one, one of the, one of the assumptions that was made, you know, the UN used to make the assumption that you couldn't get rid of poverty. It just wasn't possible. <laughs> yeah. And as we can see, you, you can do uh, quite a bit in that direction in terms of extreme poverty and things like that, if you put your uh, mind to it. Um, but one of the, the old adages is that, you know, the boom and bust cycle of the market is inescapable. You just can't get away from it. Yep. Well, I think that's very old thinking. Uh, the fact is that uh, with um, increased uh, power in terms of computing, if I'm a farmer um, in, in China and I decide, well, I want to raise, a, you know, if I, if I buy 20 piglets today, what's going to be my co uh, price at market? Yeah, I can actually sign on and based on other people signing on and a very much, a very big, uh, complete database it can actually uh, tell me, okay, your your market price is going to be this, your cost is going to be that, your you know this is what your profit is going to be. Obviously, if I sign on and it says you're going to lose money, I'm not going to buy the pigs. So that stabilizes the market, and you could have the same thing across a lot of commodities. You know, you have this boom and bust in chicken, eggs, uh, you know, beef, uh, all all the commodities, uh, even extending to um, you know wheat and soybeans and things like that. But also in terms of steel. Uh, matching up production and things like that would uh, prevent a lot of dislocation of capital, which happens when they're doing this boom and bust. There's always a loser, and that loser goes out of business, and it's not efficient for the economy to be losing those people like that. They get discouraged. They might not do it again. Uh, all the productive forces are gone. Real people get hurt because they lose their jobs. They lose their savings. It is, it's not necessary. I'm not saying you can get rid of it completely, but certainly um, there'll be tools that you can use. So it's much easier for small, medium-sized businesses and even large business to calculate future costs. Remember, business is not about taking extraordinary risks. It's about taking limited risks in the areas of your expertise. And I think uh, there are systems out there that could help uh, promote that along. The problem with that one is always that um, we have certain we have come up with certain mechanisms in order to make a uh, bust moments less likely. And one part is insurances, right? That that are there and the calculation of risk and and, and because most things are a bell curve at the end of the day, <laughs> and you can be pretty pretty as long as you have a lot of instances, you you have a good chance of mitigating these risks, but. There are moments when we create like only very few big institutions. And if those fail, if the big markets uh, create problems, like the housing market is such a, such a uh, uh, an example, then it can, it can drag other things down. And I remember 1997 was the large Asian financial crisis. Do you, John, like think that something like this, like 1997 is, thinkable again today in 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 southeast and east asia or are the um is the structure of the system now more robust well 1997 was um very traumatic for southeast asia and that's one difference between southeast asians and uh say western commentators in their perspective on the global economy uh an entire class of uh not just not just ordinary people, but financial service professionals um, went through this and drew lessons from it, and prepared accordingly, adjusted the uh, banking rules, uh, created um, monitoring mechanisms, swap arrangements uh, between the banks in the region uh, to prevent this happening again. So they prepared, you know, they 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 they've adjusted to make sure this doesn't happen again. This is unlike what's happened in the U.S. post-2008 uh, financial crisis, because where like... some of the safeguards, some of the regulatory adjustments have actually been rolled back, and you're probably in danger of this happening again. But in Southeast Asia, the uh, sort of the, the prudential management of uh, the financial sector is, I would think, pretty pretty strong. Yeah. And what we've seen in the US and in Europe too is rather a consolidation, especially of the banking sector, 
Um, Switzerland used to have two big banks and now it's only one because <laughs> the biggest one sucked up the smaller one that was about to fail. Yeah. And the, the thing is, when UBS fails, Switzerland will sink into the <laughs> into Lake Geneva and never be seen again. Um, Einar, do you think that the, the Asian financial market is actually more robust, um, robustly constituted than like the, the European and American one? Well, I, I wouldn't say robust. I, I, I would uh, agree with John. They're more cautious. Uh, they seem to have learned uh, some of the lessons. Now people do forget. Uh, and that's you know why you have a repeat of history. Uh, you have Donald Trump basically saying, you know, let the horses run free. Um, you know, that's what Clinton did uh, when he got rid of Glass-Steagall. This was the barrier between brokerage houses, insurance, and, and banks. Uh, when he said, oh, we don't need that. I'll trade that for health care. Uh, which he didn't do in the end, get to his liking in the end. Um, it, it was a, it was setting up the financial crisis in the U.S. When you forget the lessons of history, as they say, you're doomed to repeat them. So I, I, I see uh, Southeast Asia as much more cautious. Um, but you know what I what I'm talking about insurance. I was an investment banker. I, I know all the uh, financial instruments, but that concentrates on the harm afterwards. They'll pay out if you have a hurricane loss. They'll pay, you know, there are swaps that are designed to, um, you know, make it easier if for some reason you have currency fluctuations or, you know, there are fluctuations in the price of commodities that you're depending on, or there's a loss of fire, et cetera, et cetera. It's always afterwards. What I'm saying is that there are a number of risks in the financial area that you can prevent. Remember, you know, the best... There's three kind, there are a number of kinds of employees. One who doesn't see the problem. One who sees the problem and tells you about it. One who sees the problem and solves it. But the best employee is the one who anticipates a problem and prevents it. And that's where I think that we need to be. We need to be a little bit smarter. Uh, I, I know way too many professionals who think that they're just God's gift to uh, you know the earth because you know they can point to a problem or they know how to solve it. And I said, well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been better if there, this problem didn't exist? Uh, because you could see this coming and they're just like, well, you know, that's not my job. <laughs> I think yeah. it is the job of, of governments to um, be a little bit more preemptive. Yeah, yeah, just like government, governments also have a very bad track record of doing that. I mean, we are all very good at explaining post facto why, why X was obvious to come, you know, uh, well, after it happened, we're all experts on it, right? Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. No. 2020 <laughs> vision <laughs> going backwards. The, the, Insurance is definitely not the answer. I mean, AIG, for example, was right at the heart of the uh, global financial crisis. True. It's, it's really, you know, leverage, uh, extraordinary amounts of leverage and uh, a financialized uh, economy. So that structure, that, that, Anglo-Saxon model of a very heavily, which is becoming a kind of European model as well, of a extremely sort of fina uh, financial sector dominated economy, that has to change. It's opportunity to change that as you, you know, as the BRICS countries, you know, come together and rethink, uh, let's say, trade finance between themselves and rethink the currency ar arrangements. So, I mean, much of the extraordinary uh, froth and bubble effect around the dollar is is caused by this, um, uh, you know, its its ability to just print money. It's sort of this Dutch disease, right, of of being able to just print money like that. And uh, that's not something that other countries or the countries of the global south or the BRICS countries want to replicate. Uh, quite the contrary, they want to have finance remain the ancillary to the real economy. So, you know, post-1997, for example, there is nothing like the levels of, uh, you know, leverage in, in the West, in, in Asian banks, in Southeast Asian banks. I used to work in one, so it was trivial compared to that. In fact, we made the argument at the time, post-financial, uh, post-global financial crisis, you know, they were trying to enact Basel II, and we said, look, this is ridiculous. We already have these things. We, you know, this your, your extra rules are just going to, you know, just just get in the way. We we don't have the problems that you have, so um, I think it's is a chance to regroup and rethink um, the role of finance in the global economy. And are you, Pascal? I I I really think this is a strong point that uh, John has made. I mean, if you add up all of the bourses in the world, all the stock markets, the entire value on any given day, 
There's seven times that amount in financial yeah. instruments. Now, some of that is legitimate, uh, but a vast majority of it is just bets on outcomes, interest rate swings, you, you name it. And why? Why is this happening? Because it takes a long time to realize a profit on a real economy. If I'm, you know, put money into a factory, there's a certain amount of time to build it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but if I'm betting on an interest uh, rate uh, change in the near future, oh man, if I get it right, my bonus is going to be huge, right? So people um, have this sh very, very short-term mentality. Uh, it, you know, it's often talked about, you know, Wall Street is quarter to quarter and then, you know, year to year. Um, and the five-year stuff, boy, you know, it really, it, it's hardly there. Compare that to uh, places like China, where they're thinking, you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 years ahead, very, very different in terms of how they're uh, sh shaping things. And I think that's one of the primary weaknesses that is bringing down uh, a lot of the West. There will come a reckoning point. Remember, financialization and these bets are a zero-sum game. Not only zero-sum, you have winners and losers, but there's a, a, a large amount, uh, percentage of that goes away in terms of the fees that are paid to in fact, Banks, investment banking, uh, you know, insurance companies, rating agencies, uh, advisors, accountants, etc. It starts to add up. So at some point, uh, I'm hoping that governments uh, become uh, just do as uh, as China and other countries are doing, and just saying, look, we'll support the real economy, but we're not going to get involved in helping uh, our economy depend on financialization. And doesn't that doesn't that raise the question whether the system that we are going toward, also in BRICS and, and in general, isn't co maybe going to be one that might rethink um, finance and especially investment financing heavily? As in, maybe we just don't want that anymore. This investment financing bets, uh, the J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, and uh, I I do have a friend in one of one of these large ones, and one of the things she says, something that they are afraid of, is that. If the U.S. starts imitating um, China and starts closing off its own markets and and treat them like much more um, thoroughly, then uh, there will be there will be a large problem um, because the China they don't have access to the Chinese markets. They cannot uh, investment banks cannot act in uh, in the Chinese banking market the way they can in in Europe or in North America. Um, what's that going to do, John? I think we lost John. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, ob obviously, uh, JP Morgan and all the investment banks depend on financializations. I mean, go, go back when they were, they were uh, selling products that <laughs> against their clients' interests, <laughs> uh, basically, you know, creating hedges for themselves <laughs> on, uh, on events, as I said, going back to predicting outcomes and then uh, making a tremendous amount of money on it. Well, how do they do that? Leverage. They go out and borrow enormous amounts of money. That's why there's so much uh, money in financialization, uh, because they, they're looking for small moves that they think are safe. Or big moves if they if they have the the guts, uh, and then making piles of money uh, doing it. Uh, but as I said, it kind of uh, catches up, uh, up with you after a while. Now, in, in terms, uh, you you still have to have some sort of finance. But if you have electronic currency and you have hybrid banks that are able to understand and make much quicker decisions. Uh, based on a AI, they can uh, look at a person, their history, uh, social credit score. It's not perfect, all right, but it will allow them to make uh, credit decisions uh, much more quickly. So instead of waiting for months and weeks, to figure out whether or not to do it, uh, they can <clears throat> instantly have the AI check the prices uh, the, for everything from labor down to nuts and bolts, what the machine would cost, uh, land, uh, how long it takes to do, what the return is going to be, and they can estimate it. It's not going to be exactly. Now, please don't don't think that I'm dis <clears throat> describing a panacea because I'm not. Uh, what happens, as I said, is you come up with a new system and then that just creates new problems. But I'm saying that things are going to move in this direction simply because of the efficiency of it, lower cost. Uh, this is what people want. Uh, if, I, if I do a dollar denominated trade, it's going to cost me X. Uh, if I do, um, uh, you know, this other system, gee, it's a fraction of X. Now, gee whiz, which one I'm going to go for? <laughs> Especially small, medium-sized business entities or, who don't have uh, uh, other issues. Now, 
Obviously, there's going to be some uh, pushback against this. Uh, JP and all the boys are going to be saying, no, 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 don't change anything. Uh, or they, some of them might embrace it and try to figure out ways that they can make money. They have a lot of smart people there. Um, but you could see uh, governments, especially the U.S., uh, as Donald Trump has you know, recently said, any country that doesn't use the dollar will be punished. We won't trade with them. And, uh, you know, it's you, know, you don't know if he's no one knows what Donald Trump means. Uh, but there's a real likelihood that he could be elected. And if that is the case, uh, the world is going to go into turmoil. And the reflexive, um, defensive reaction is going to be uh, around what entities like um, uh, BRICS, as opposed to the UN, where the US can use its considerable sway and also its veto uh, when it wants to. Yeah, and now we are now we are back to the to the importance of BRICS as a, as kind of as counter stabilizer. I mean, not just for the financial markets and and the economy, but also as a political as a as a political counterweight without being a security risk. Right? This is a big under, misunderstanding, and I think John, you pointed it out several times that there we the, BRICS doesn't have a security component, and we don't actually need to to fear that or. Or do you think that there will be a change now because of what we are seeing in West Asia? Um, I don't think, yeah, I, I don't think there's a reason to fear BRICS in, in, in that in that regard. I mean, they have, might have, it might be a forum for conversations between countries about what to do in West Asia. Um, they might be able to come up with a statement, I'm not sure, um, on it. Uh, but uh, it's not primarily that. It's not an it's not a it's not a strategic or military um, alliance, and and that some people have difficult time. Uh, you know, if you have a NATO mindset, you see everything in NATO terms, and it's just not that. Uh, from an ASEAN perspective, it's it's really quite clear. You can have uh, regional multilateral arrangements that are not anybody's um, enemy that are, that remain open. So I think BRICS has some of that um, DNA some of that 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 heritage of thinking which is really not new in the global south and it's as you know it also has uh you know uh, genealogy in in western ideas about new, neutrality and the value of neutrality but um i think th those core values are uh, will will remain i think in the brick setup not not no not it doesn't you know countries don't have to be explicitly sign on to these principles that's the only way they're going to come together that's the basis on which they're going to come together. Uh, yeah. Last round of questions, uh, starting with you, Einar. Do you think that looking at the, the new um, prime minister of Japan and a couple of the funny things he said about, um, you know, um, equalizing the relationship with, uh, with the United States, do you think that there's a chance of winning over uh, Japan to cooperate more in these multilateral um for uh, remembering that in 1955 Japan was actually in Bandung too, they were there and then they they left, but they were there in the beginning. Do you think Japan might come back to to this? Well, okay, let's uh, go back a little into history. It was uh, the U U.S. Navy that forced uh, Japan to open up its ports to um, whalers who wanted a place to you know get fresh water and fresh food. Uh, that led to the Meiji Restoration. Uh, rapid industrialization. Uh, then they adopted the Western colonial uh, side of this. Uh, World War II comes along and we defeat them. Uh, we light off two bombs. I don't think they're going to forget Hiroshima or Nagasaki. And uh, then to pour salt on the wounds, uh, we've, we force a constitution on them and we occupy them. There are still 48,000 American troops stationed uh, in various places around uh, Japan. Uh, then on top of that, is, is the real salt on the wounds was uh, Japan was rising. Uh, the, you know the, uh, the the efforts to rebuild Japan, Japan were very successful. They went from you know you know made in Japan meant you know cheap nasty stuff to made in Japan meant quality, uh, and they had you know innovative products and things like that. And that um, in the late seventies they're rising. They're selling cars. They're uh, you know they're the next great power. And what happens? The U.S. says. No, you're using subsidized um, industries to kill our industries. You're trying to take over the world. They even accused the LDP 
uh, the government of not being democratic because they had been there since uh, the turnover. They forgot to mention that it was the U.S. government that put uh, the LDP in power, and that's how Shinzo Abe's grandfather was somehow miraculously pardoned and went from war criminal to being a leader, a senior leader of the LDP. So, you know, Japan has every reason uh, to not like the United States. And for <clears throat> their purposes, they would love for the U.S. to leave. They don't want uh, American troops on their soil. <clears throat> you, you, you of all people in Kyoto know that uh, they're not fond of having foreign soldiers on their things. It's an insult uh, to their national aspirations. This new leader is charting a course that was started by uh, Shinzo Abe, which is this idea that we're going to play the U.S., we'll play the China card. Uh, and this is my own personal belief, that they're playing the China card so that they can, quote, normalize um, their uh, defense capabilities. But I assure you, the moment that Japan has a nuclear uh, weapon, uh, that will be the moment that the U.S. is asked to leave uh, Japan. And uh, then they will chart their own course. I, it is very hard to, uh, for me to believe, given the history, that Japan somehow believes that the U.S. is their deep, lifelong friend. All right. They're not even really an ally. And given what's happened in the rest of the places, they have reasons to doubt whether the U.S. would actually commit in any given uh, set of scenarios. Not that there's any, you know, no one's looking to invade Japan or anything like that. And North Korea, you know, if they sent off uh, nuclear bombs towards anywhere, they would be obliterated. Um, so I, I really don't see that as the, the main issue. I see this as a long-term strategy where Japan wants to normalize its things afterwards. Uh, they have a lot of economic issues that they have to address internally in terms of their debt, externally in terms of their competitiveness uh, factor. Um, and I think that would lead them towards trying to uh, join a working, efficient working <laughs> group uh, like uh, uh, BRICS or uh, RCEP, et cetera, folding in TPP or the TCPTP into uh, that. Why? Uh, they exist on trade. They need to have uh, those exports and uh, they need to have a competitive uh, industry. So a lot of things have to happen. Sorry, long yeah. answer. Uh, but but it, it's, an, it's an interesting input. I The only thing I would hold against this is that to all the Japanese security thinkers that I know over here, to them, the US-Japan alliance is what to the, Europe, to the Europeans is NATO. It's like, that's the mindset. It's just like so ingrained. It's, they don't perceive it in, in, in the sense of like occupation or continued occupation, perceive it in the sense of like, oh, this is how we- Get them we drunk. Get them things. really drunk and ask them what they think of having uh, US soldiers on their soil. <laughs> I'll try, uh, but I, I'm interested in John. John, uh, how, I, do you, how do you perceive the, the Japan factor? This is a really, really interesting question. I had a very brief exchange on 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 X Twitter X with you about this, right? Where um, I, you know, I, I just sort of panned um, um, Ishiba's, you know, Asian NATO idea, and I was doing it very aware, you know, you know, consciously doing it as a reaction to just the idea, which is actually absurd. Quite frankly, it's not going to work, okay? Just, just as an idea by itself. Nobody's going to join this from Southeast Asia, all right? Maybe Philippines, right, for a while. And if they change pre precedence, you know, there might be problems with that. But um, not to get into that, uh, you know, you reminded me of the, the thing you, you did, the episode you did here on your on your on this channel, uh, where you discussed some of the nuances behind it, the context of this plan and what they were trying to do, and there, Einar's comments are, are really germane, and I completely agree. You know, this needs a whole. This could be a session unto itself, or a whole series on a really tortured relationship, mm -hmm. because what Einar said is. Wonderful, and it's probably true. Uh, I haven't had the benefit of getting as many Japanese guys drunk, but it's it's true that 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 strand of resentment is there, but it expresses itself in very strange ways. It's not in the open. This is the first time I've heard it. You know, you're not going to see it stated so clearly. You certainly are not going to hear it from a Japanese anywhere near officialdom, right? Any any of establishment Japanese will not say this. Uh, but it's a really difficult issue. This question of, as I said, this embarrassing situation for them of being de facto sort of occupied 
And the point at which they express resistance to it is this matter of the constitution. Reform or renovation, it's not just about removing Article 9. Establishing our own constitution is seen as vital to the restoration of Japanese sovereignty and their pride as this ancient nation, right? It's the project of Jishu Kempo, uh, our own our independent constitution. Do you know that's written into the founding charter of the LDP? So it's always been there. And at the same time, the LDP is an absolute creature of the security alliance of the whole 1952 system. So, you know, and they depend on 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 the, on, on the system for for their you know their legitimacy. And in fact, sometimes in, in terms of you know maintaining them in power at certain moments. So, so while those while that that impulse is there, I completely with 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 Pascal on this. They're not going to talk about it. You know, I was on the sidelines listening in or talking to people around the time when something like this was broached, AIIB. Remember when that idea came up? The Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. China approached Japan, and I think with the offer to co-chair it, the Japanese were interested. I th so one part of the bureaucracy of the Japanese deep state was interested, another part no, right? And I think it was Miti versus uh, MFA. And very senior guys, one of the guys you always hear, you know, on uh, sort of representing or, or you know, whispering, uh, the, one of the Japan whisperers was was uh, very, very confident. Japan would join the AIAB. Naoko, whom you, uh, my, my wife, whom you've spoken with, you know, w was very involved in, 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 in that and thought, wow, they really should you know, this was an important moment when uh, something like the BRICS, where you had an Asian infrastructure investment bank, there, there was a real chance Japan would have joined, and then it didn't happen. So, so it's a really, uh, I wouldn't underestimate the extent to which there's a kind of uh, a deep conflict and an inability to express this, this uh, what the real problem is. So it comes out, this issue of being a normal country, another way this is talked about is we want to be normal, right? But surely they understand that you cannot have normal relations with the United States on equal terms. You know, setting up Britain as your example, it's, it's, all, it's truly laughable, right? The US does not have peers. <laughs> you know, that's doctrinal, <laughs> that's structural. You know? We're exceptional. <laughs> <laughs> that is built in. It's not about you know, this or that uh, sort of Secretary of State being a nice guy. It does not brook peers. But for, for Japan, this is not the case. And then there is a kind of imperial hangover about their role in Asia. So underneath this talk, whether it's Ishiba or whether it was Abe, there's a whole set of these issues which are not articulated, uh, you know, in any clear way to, to people outside. And of course, there's also a right-wing revanchist element that wants, you know, the old Japan, Meiji Japan back because they did write a draft of this constitution they wanted and it was just the Meiji, the Meiji constitution with the emperor restored to that role. So, you know, uh, I would agree. I mean, if Japan could take the step of having some presence at BRICS, if they had the guts to do that, it would be very, very interesting. Ultimately, Japan's problem is how to you know, reverse their exit Asia, enter Europe thing. Their, their problem is really how to enter Asia, exit the, the, Europe. The big re-enter, the big coming... The they big need return. to re-enter Asia. They need to find their place again in it. In, and it's as much a cultural, emotional issue among the... And this is really a kind of a small Japanese elite because the, I think the rest would follow as, as anything else. Many of them, I think Aina is right about, well, you get them sufficiently drunk, they might say this, but a lot of them see this U.S. relationship as what makes them distinctive. It's what makes them sort of one of the great powers in 19th century style, as if that idea was still at all, re you know, made it any sense at all, right? We want to be like Britain. Who wants to be like Britain? Nobody in the global south wants to be like Britain. Only you do. So, so you know, Japan is sort of lost. Its, its, its political elite is sort of lost in, in, in that regard. But you're there. And it's actually a much more interesting place than people give it due for. And I think this, this conversation brings out some of that, that interest.
I, I, I'm just always afraid that Japan misreads or misinterprets what's going on, especially in, in the US and Europe, because there's a history of kind of yes, yes. Then, then trying to imitate something, imitating it on the surface, but beneath, like doing something completely different. And then that makes yeah. it just difficult yeah. to understand where they are. Yeah. They need um, the sort of resolve, the kind of elite resolve and group, seriously, a group of young people, capable young people, able to, uh, of leadership, able to do again for them what they were able to do for the uh, during uh, the post Meiji restoration because that was you know that's an exemplary thing how how they how they they turned it around and grasped the historical moment right they went towards this western model which had horrible effects uh, for for the rest of asia but that's another story there were other possibilities in that movement towards sort of pan-Asianism, for example. There was a whole set of ideals. Japan was far more interesting intellectually uh, back then than it is now, or at least maybe I'm not seeing it, right? Maybe everybody needs to get drunk before they can start to have ideas. But <laughs> yeah. Einar, it was your idea to get the Japanese drunk. Do you have a last idea to reply to that and then we wrap it up? No, I agree. I agree with John. It's, uh, you know, we, we all have our differences. Japan... Um... It's an old culture, and as you know, things are on the surface one way and underneath yeah. completely different. Yeah, yeah exactly. this this is the cue for us all. Let's let's get drunk and get honest. Um, <laughs> I, I thank you both for an honest discussion without being drunk. Yeah, you know veritas. In wine is truth. In wine is truth. In our tongue, Jean Peng. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.